Hi, Phil Chandler here. Today I want to talk to you about a particular tree that I have a certain fondness for and that I believe has some application to our beekeeping that maybe not is not obvious and maybe needs a little bit more investigation. The tree in question is the, the birch, the silver birch specifically, uh, Betula pendula is its Latin name. It's a tree that's generally taken for granted a bit in, in this country, I fear. Um, it's, it is definitely a tree of the northern climes. It's very, very common in Scandinavia. I saw forests of the things in, in Norway last year. Um, up here, when I say up here, I mean I'm at, at the moment on the top of a hill uh, on the site or close to the site of an old Iron Age hill fort. Uh, it, it is a tree in this country that's mostly found um, with a bit of altitude, a bit, a bit above sea level. We're about, I guess, about somewhere about a thousand feet up at the moment. Um, and there's lots of birch around here, any, any amount of the stuff. It's growing all over these woods. In fact, I would say it's the dominant species in this part of the woods. But the, um, the point is that the, the birch tree has uh, many uses. Uh, I, you, you'll, you'll, you'll probably be familiar with its use in, uh, in plywood, for example. It gives that, that beautifully white, clean uh, look to, to, to high-quality plywood. Um, but we're interested in, the, in, its, in its, what should we say, if not medicinal, then at least therapeutic possibilities. And it has been regarded uh, particularly in the Scandinavian countries for probably centuries, if, if, if not longer, um, as having beneficial properties, particularly uh, this time of year, and it's now late February, through March, or th certainly through the early part of March, is the season where people tap the, the sap of the birch tree and use it as a drink, as a, as a stimulant drink. It has a uh, it has a sugar content. I think, I, I, from memory, I think it's around about five percent. It's not. It's not a not a big sugar content. But it, what it does have is a lot of bioavailable minerals. In other words, you know, digestible and usable minerals. And it has a lot of amino acids. And so, um, the fact that it's not tapped and, and used so much in this country, in England, in Britain. Um, is, is kind of testament to our uh, having forgotten probably the, the the old knowledge of the of the medicinal uses of the birch tree so there's a couple of things that might be relevant to our beekeeping one is the sap itself now I have a feeling that the the, the sap uh, because of its uh, mineral and amino acid content in particular may well be something that bees um, have an interest in and could benefit um, bees uh, nutritionally. So one of the experiments I'm going to do is to feed birch sap to bees to see how they respond to it and um, if necessary perhaps increase its sugar content to make it a little bit more attractive to them, a bit more useful to them in terms of carbohydrates. But um, I'm, I'm interested to see how they are going to take um, the, the, the sap down um, to, to what extent and at what's, what rate and so on and, and whether it actually benefits them. Now the problem of course with all these sorts of experiments um, is that you know how do you measure the results and that's, that's something I struggled with for, for, for a long time. Um, how do you measure the results of, of an experiment with bees because um, I don't have a laboratory, uh, I don't have um, uh, scientific apparatus to do detailed analysis of things so I can't you know do, do the classic thing of taking you know a hundred bees or a thousand bees in laboratory conditions um, and, and uh, several batches of them uh, as identical as possible and then keeping them in the same conditions feeding them exactly the same thing and using controls and things like that I just don't have those kind of facilities now if somebody's out out there wants to, to, to give me a grant so I can acquire those sorts of facilities then you know I'm more than happy to do that but um, you know, that's not uh, likely to happen uh, this week, I don't think, um, unless anybody watching you know, has other ideas. So what can we do? So one thing I can test is simply to give uh, the raw birch sap 
to bees and um, see how they respond to it. Do, you know, do, do they do they uh, are they attracted to it? Are they repelled by it? Are they kind of not very interested in that kind of thing? Um, the next thing I can do is to uh, r r raise the sugar content to the point where it's more like a one-to-one -one syrup, for, for example, and give it give it to them. Then, well, obviously, you know, chances are unless they are actually repelled by the smell or the taste, they're going to go for anything that's got that kind of amount of sugar in it. So that's not really a, a very good test. Ideally, what we want to be able to do is to measure the results over time. So, you know, that might be things like, well, you take a, a number of hives and you give half of them uh, birch sap and half of them not, or, you know, a control thing like just water and sugar. Um, and then you compare the weights uh, over time, um, which is a would be, would be a you know give some sort of valid data. Um, but again, you need numbers to make it do anything conclusive. You need numbers of hives to do that, and those hives have got to be as near identical as possible. And again, you know, I, I really don't have the resources to to operate at that kind of scale. So what I'm hoping is that other people might do this sort of experiment as well, um, and I'm going to show you. How to how well, how we tap birch trees. There are other ways of doing it, of course, but the way we've uh, developed to tap a birch tree seems to work pretty damn well. So you might, uh, if you're interested in this, try uh, at this time of year. Now, in, in we're in Devon uh, and it's uh, mid to late February. Um, in, over the next three to four weeks, I reckon is going to be the peak season for birch sap. Um, again, you know, do look this up and don't just take my word for it because I may be wrong, but that seems to be the case, that, that, that late February, early March is the time to do it. And the, the taps that we've done so far have produced, we've got about five litres, I think, at the moment, taken over a period of maybe three days on and off from three, possibly four different trees. So, you, you know, you can get reasonable quantities of the stuff reasonably quickly and easily. Um, obviously you need access to some birch trees, but you know, that, that's, that's something, a problem for you to resolve, I can't do that for you. Um, so, you could just take some raw birch sap and expose some bees to it. So you could just put it in a feeder and watch what the bees do. Do, they, do the bees take it? Do they take it quickly? Um, do they approach it and then retreat? You know, all those kinds of things you can do, just do by observation. If anybody has the facility to do some actual measurement, uh, and that might mean, hmm, I guess, measuring the weight of the hive um, over a period of time. Also, you know, does it have any effect on the varroa count? Who knows? I don't know. Would it? Could it? Um, what we're trying to do, obviously, is provide nutrition for the bees. We're not trying to provide a chemical that's going to kill anything, uh, hopefully. Um, certainly not, you know, it's not likely to have any effect on varroa that I'm aware of. But it, what, it, what it hopefully will do is give the bees a bit of a boost and make them more uh, able to withstand some of the, um, shall we say, toxic effects of, of, of the parasite, of, of the varroa mites. So, yeah, who knows? Um, it's just something we'll have, we'll have to try and find out. The other aspect of this is um, the ecofloor. Now, now, a lot of people have... Uh, expressed interest in the eco floor, and recently I've been in correspondence with a um, a, a, a PhD um, in in in, uh, in south of France, attached to one of the universities in France, and that sort of stimulated my thinking again about the um, about the eco floor. Now, the thing about the birch tree is that it supports some very interesting um, fungi with known medicinal properties. Amongst them are the uh, birch polypore, that's a, 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 a very obvious one, which tends to appear on dying birch trees. Um, I haven't got any, any here, I haven't seen any here within shot, so I can't show you them, but the birch polypore uh, is, is quite a, a big um, bracket fungus and it's, it's whitish and it has a smooth top. Um, and it has pores underneath rather than gills, so it's very easy to recognize and it grows on birch trees. Um, two more, there's the reishi, which is very well known medicinally and very widely used medicinally, particularly in the Far East. And um, the, what's the third one? Oh, chaga, of course, which is um, a, a, another very well known medicinal um, fungus, which is common in 
the Scandinavian countries. I found it in Norway. Um, I've never found it in this country, but I, I believe it grows in Scotland uh, and possibly northern England. Um, never found it in the West Country. Uh, again, somebody did tell me once that it, that it does exist here, but I, I honestly don't know. I've never seen it. So those three, uh, Chaga, Reishi and uh, the Birch Polypore, um, they are they all have medicinal properties there. They have, they've, they've been quite um, well researched, I believe, and there are papers that you can read about them and what they can do for you. So now, if this one tree supports um, three of, of the most well-known medicinal fungi, um, I think that tree's got, you know, has got something going for it. Now, people say it's, some, it's the betulinic acid, which is, which is the magic ingredient, and that, and that may well be the case, I don't know. Um, but so I'm thinking, relating to the ecofloor, I'm thinking, well, perhaps if we can put uh, things like birch bark and also more, probably more so, um, birch sawdust uh, as the, or at least part of the, the floor material in the ecofloor, then that's surely got to be worth exploring. You know, if, if, if that tree supports um, those, those kinds of, of, uh, of medicinal um, fungi and the sap contains amino acids and minerals, this tree's got a lot going for it compared to, to many. So it's something we need to investigate. So I'm hoping that other people might take this up as well and see what they can do, what, see what they can find out. Anyone that's got lab facilities and can do the analyses, anyone that's got you know, sufficient numbers of bees that they can do side-by-side -side testing, um, you know, I think there's, there's stuff to be learned here. And uh, uh, I only wish I had the facilities to do it all myself, but I don't. So anyway, that's it for, for chat. I'm, gonna, I'm going to now take you over to where we've been tapping a couple of trees and I'm going to show you how we've done it. So here's the arrangement that we've uh, worked out that works pretty well actually. What I've done is to drill a 16 millimeter hole into the tree, about I would say 25 to 30 millimeters deep and I've knocked in um, an oak peg, which uh, is nominally 18 millimeters. So I've tapered it slightly towards the, uh, uh, the the tree end, as it were. And I've drilled a hole, which you can probably see, of about, I don't know, three, four millimeters, clear down the, the center of the dowel. And then what I've done is just drop this bottle over the dowel. Now, you'd think, well, okay, you'd think that that's gonna fall off, but in fact, um, it, it hasn't, it doesn't fall off. Um, I've tested it and, and there's actually enough friction, especially as the bottle accumulates sap, uh, there's enough friction there for that to stay in place rather well. Now at the bottom of this bottle you can see there's a little bit of sap that's been, this bottle's been in place maybe half an hour or so. Um, and the, it's actually, the drip has actually slowed down considerably since yesterday when I set this up. So. I'm thinking that probably the tree um, is uh, hanging onto its sap and, and maybe maybe they have a way of kind of healing up inside and just closing off the, uh, the, 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 the hole, as it were, that the sap's coming out. But um, this doesn't harm the tree. It's, it's practiced widely in, the, in, in uh, Scandinavia, particularly in Russia, and it doesn't do the tree any harm. And if you, don't, if you only leave it on there for a few days at a time, um, the, the tree's you know, not going to be bothered about it at all because uh, uh, it can easily take that, that little hit of, um, uh, of leakage, if you like. So it's a very simple method of doing it. There are other ways of doing it, which you can find online, I'm quite sure. I know you can because I've seen them. <laughs> but this is basically the, the principle. You just have a, uh, a tap and you can see that we've actually drilled it in at an angle so the, it's going slightly uphill obviously so that the liquid runs down. I mean, that's pretty obvious really. Um, works very well. And when you're done with this particular hole, then it's very easy just to plug it up by just tapping a, um, a twig into the, into the end of this. Or in fact, you could take the, the, the tube out altogether and just tap a, a blind dowel into the hole and the whole thing will, will heal up nicely and um, it'll, the tree will be absolutely fine afterwards. So that's how it's done anyway. Um, I would say probably, you know, do it with care, do it, do it 
um, don't damage trees, um, do it a little bit at a time and uh, see what sort of results you get. The actual liquid itself, um, there's not much in here yet, um, is clear, it's quite watery, um, it has a uh, mild flavour, it's, it's quite a, it's a pleasant flavour, it's not a, it doesn't, it's slightly, I would say slightly bitter with a hint of sweetness, something like that. Um, it's made into, uh, I think some people make it into wine, that's something I want to try, and it has, uh, it, it's widely consumed in Scandinavia as a spring stimulant, which is, seems to be its most appropriate use. Anyway, there we are, that's it, and uh, have fun, and maybe do some experiments with birch yourself. Here's an example of the birch polypore growing on a fallen birch tree, and you'll often find that there are several growing on the same. Yeah, there's another one right there. You'll often find them in, uh, in groups on these old. And there's another one, an old one under there. So yeah, fallen birch or, or standing birch that's uh, that's nearing the end of its days will often have birch polypore showing.